today we're going to talk about, we're just going to quickly go over background because a lot of what I've talked about has been discussed already. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the imaging protocol for MRI. I am a, a radiologist and my focus is MRI. Um, but there are some other modalities like ultrasound that was already spoken about um, and I think we may talk about that at the end. Um, I'll review preoperative assessment um, and how I look at it and how we image it and postoperative assessment in addition to some reporting. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, I don't have any books. I know there are a lot of books written here. <laughs> Maybe one day. Uh, only that I'm a radiologist. And, you know, this, this conference is definitely a success. And, uh, boy, it's nice to be with plastic surgeons. I mean, the gift box is amazing. You know, <laughs> radiologists don't get gift boxes like that. Um, okay, so we talked a lot about uh, etiology, pathophysiology, and others have done much better than me at, at describing this. So I'm going to... I'm going to skip over these. Um, we obviously know um, this is a big problem worldwide, uh, and there are non-surgical and surgical techniques. Um, most of what I've seen is, is focused on uh, two gentlemen in the front, uh, uh, Mark and Joe, and we have really developed our protocol by working as a team together. So this was really fun for me. You know, the, as a radiologist, kind of bored of just doing routine imaging, I met these two guys and, uh, and we developed this protocol together. So the most important thing that I like to do is answer the clinical question at hand without wasting too much time doing some nonsensical imaging that, that just uh, makes, you know, for pretty pictures but doesn't actually answer the question. Um, so we have this multidisciplinary approach and develop an MRI protocol uh, with surgical input. Um, and review images together so that we know what works and what doesn't work. Um, so the idea is to really display relevant anatomy, whether that's soft tissue, fat, fluid, lymphatics, um, and cover certain body parts. Uh, tissue characterization, um, and specifically, is there, is there a chance where maybe we can quantify fluid and fat using uh, 3D techniques? Um, patient satisfaction, you know, that's a big driver in hospitals these days. We're getting paid by it. Um, and we, we don't want patients in the magnet too long. When, when we first started this protocol years back, um, we had older equipment and uh, they, they could be three hours long, as someone else quoted. I think Dr. Nelligan, maybe his group said they were three hours long and, and so were ours. Uh, and now with newer equipment, uh, uh, newer coil technology, it's down to about an hour. Um, and then also, you know, there are other compliance issues for, for billing that, that you have to make sure you, you review. Um, so for MRI, again, I'm, we're going to focus on MRI. So really the hallmark of what you've seen, a lot of the imaging you, that you've looked at today and what other people are doing are very high resolution T1 weighted images. This, these are fluid dark images. Um, and these can be fat bright or fat dark, and I'll show you both kinds of images. Um, on different vendors, whether it's GE, Siemens, or Philips, they have different names. Um, but we really get these high uh, spatial resolutions, and we interpolate really to the highest possible resolution you can get. And it's about a one millimeter voxel. So we get 3D data sets that you can then manipulate in different planes. So, you know, I'll go over how we, uh, so in the legs, we acquire them coronally, so from front to back. So you've seen a bunch of coronal acquisitions for legs. But you can reformat those in an axial plane or a sagittal plane. Uh, it's just the quickest time is to acquire it coronally. However, for arms, um, the, the best way to do it is to acquire it sagittally. And that's because of time, but also artifacts in MRI. Um, and uh, uh, so I'll show you some images of that. Um, for contrast, because we, wanted, we like to do as much as we can in one setting, uh, we do give contrast, uh, intravenous contrast. So there are a bunch of different contrasts that are available. There are about nine different gadolinium MR contrasts, which is different than CT contrast. You know, CT is iodine-based and MRI is gadolinium-based. Um, we used to give uh, Ablevar, which is a blood pool agent that would stay in the blood pool, but unfortunately uh, the company stopped making it, so now we're not using it. Um, so there, uh, which Dr. Nelligan already went over, uh, Jeff Maki and, and, and he used ferromoxetol, which is not even a gadolinium contrast agent. It's actually 
uh, a treatment for iron deficiency anemia. Somebody put someone in an MRI scanner afterwards, found out you get great signal. Um, uh, so, so that's another option for us. But the one that was probably the, the, the best gadolinium agent to use is Multihance. Um, and that's because it gets the highest signal on these T1-weighted images. Um, so if you're going to select a magnet to image your patients on, uh, if you probably know that these days there are small bore magnets and wide bore magnets. And when I talk about a wide bore magnet, I do not mean an open magnet. So if anyone tries to scan on an open magnet, those are very poor quality magnets. So uh, those are usually low field uh, Tesla strength. So I'm talking about wider magnets that are much better for um, our bariatric populations. So most of the scanners we're installing are these wider bore scanners. And they're, they're also shorter, so they don't feel as claustrophobic as the older ones. Um, uh, if you're scanning lower extremities, uh, it's really nice to have a surface coil so you get the best signal from toes to pelvis. Um, that's not cheap. It's at least $150,000 just to buy that coil. Um, so i talking to colleagues here who, who work at BID. They do have that coil, and, and so do we. Um, you can scan either on 1.5 or 3 Tesla. Um, uh, e either one works great. The, the key is uh, that decreased our exam time from three hours to one hour, partly is this new sequence called, uh, uh, it's a Dixon's uh, technique to suppress fat. So essentially you get water images, uh, fat only images, in and out of phase images, which is really four sequences all in one and very little reconstruction time. We used to have to acquire these uh, sequences separately. Uh, they take a minute or two to acquire, but then to, for the computer to process it, it would take seven minutes and you couldn't scan. So patient and technologists would just sit and twiddle thumbs while uh, the, the images were being processed. Um, so, so that's really a, a huge win for us. Um, for, for upper extremities, we use more routine coils that come with any MRI package. Um, uh, again, 1.5 and 3 Tesla have their advantages and disadvantages. 3 Tesla, in general, you get more signal. Um, however, you also get more artifacts. Um, and since we're imaging extremities, which are on the side, uh, upper extremities, you're at the edge of the MRI, and that causes more artifacts than, you know, legs, which are more in the middle. Um, and also, uh, for upper extremities, you know, you have to image one and then image the other. Just because you're inside a magnet doesn't mean that we can uh, uh, image both at the same time. The image quality isn't great. For legs, however, you do image them at the same time. So here's uh, some, some pictures from uh, uh, the internet just showing this is uh, a peripheral vascular coil. So you basically cover from uh, uh, at least pelvic brim all the way down to toes, which sometimes are sticking out there. Um, but this provides really nice coverage. You can see that it wraps around so you get great signal um, of both extremities. Uh, this is the routine kind of body surface coil um, that we use for upper extremity imaging. Notice how that it's much shorter than this coil, um, and you have to really put it on one side of the arm. So this coil would have to be moved and then placed over this extremity. You'd have to scan the upper arm first, then you move it and scan the lower arm second. Um, and I think, yeah, on this slide, I just want to show, this is my, sorry I made this last night, but anyway, this is supposed to be an MRI. And the, uh, the pink dot is the isocenter. So that's where you get the best signal in an MRI. So everything has to be in the center or as close to it as possible. So if this is a patient uh, that's kind of turned, and this is the isocenter, that pink dot, notice how the coil is moved to one side of the arm. Um, so what we do is actually we'll start by scanning the unaffected upper extremity first, and we'll ask the patient um, to put the uh, affected extremity above the arm and kind of scooch them over to try and get this arm as isocenter as possible, and then flip it and do the reverse. So you can imagine the upper extremity takes a little bit longer than lower extremity. Um, so what are some of the goals of, of preoperative imaging? Um, uh, we've heard some of this already, but I'll, I'll tell you our goals. Uh, we want to do a complete limb assessment since, you know, we're putting a patient through this procedure. We want to get as much information as possible. We want to evaluate the extent of uh, lymphedema versus fat hypertrophy, so fluid versus fat. 
Um, since we're getting a 3D acquisition, you can always do uh, 3D volume assessment, so I'll give you some examples of that. Um, lymphatic uh, anatomy, we've had some great discussion already uh, for Dr. Nelligan, I'll, sh I'll, I'll give some examples of that. Vascular assessment, uh, Joe talked about this morning about how you can have some venous uh, occlusive disease. Um, so we, we also look at that with our contrast imaging. Um, we look at donor sites and, and now, you know, I'm learning uh, both through them but also through this conference, you know, really groin, we, we used to do a lot of donor site evaluation for groin lymph nodes. Um, if we're not, we're not going to be good at doing donor site evaluation of momentum, um, uh, but we can talk about that later. Uh, recipient site evaluation, so looking at medial sural vessels. And, uh, and then, of course, excluding other causes for limb swelling. Uh, unfortunately, that's the worst call I have to make is if I have to call up uh, one, of, one of my surgeons and, and tell them that I, I see something that's, that's worrisome uh, as a cause for, for limb swelling. Um, so looking at limb architecture, you, you've seen some of these images before. Here's a lower extremity where you see an unaffected extremity with normal fat signals. So these are T1 weighted images, so fluid dark, fat bright images. Um, and you can see in the affected extremity uh, really al almost a river, so to speak, of, of fluid uh, laterally. Here's an upper extremity, same idea, fluid dark, fat bright imaging. Um, so you can now, you know, the, these are very thin isotrophic uh, voxels that you can then um, uh, upload to a third-party uh, software program that can automatically calculate um, uh, volumes for you. Um, so, so one of my residents uh, had a great idea of just really selecting all the background noise, then selecting the extremity, and within 60 seconds you can have a, a volume calculation. The, the caveat for the upper extremity, as I, as I showed you, you're imaging sections at a time, so you really can only measure volumes based on sections. But we can, you know, use techniques like, you know, 15 centimeters from an elbow joint north and south, then, you know, that can be reproducible over time uh, that you can compare. Uh, so lymphatic imaging options, we, we've talked about a bunch already. Um, uh, so I'm just going to focus on MRL. And as you heard, there's non-contrast uh, MRL, which is really kind of just fluid-sensitive imaging, uh, contrast-enhanced, and then uh, uh, a great technique to, to get rid of venous contamination, double-agent relaxation, which, which was already mentioned. Um, so non-contrast MRL um, is really just in, for, for the surgeons in the audience and, and for those who you know, work in a hospital, if you heard of an MRCP where you look at the biliary tract, that's really all it is. So you're just doing an MRCP sequence that you normally would do over the liver gallbladder and you're just doing it over the affected extremity, whether it's uh, arms or legs. Um, the pros are that it's no contrast um, and it depicts uh, fluid and dilated lymphatics. However, um, the cons are that you really only see these dilated lymphatics if it's really severe. Um, and and he, he, here's a description, so, so maybe you'll see early stage severe lymphatics, but in my experience, we, we really do struggle um, seeing non-contrast uh, uh, nice MR uh, lymphangiography. Um, uh, and it does add time. I, t I told you about patient satisfaction. Uh, we don't want patients on the magnet for too long. So, so and these are, these are long sequences. Um, contrast enhanced MRL, meaning not intravenous, right, but intradermal injection. Um, you get excellent visualization of lymphatics. Um, it can be painful during injection, and it does cost table time. Um, but, you know, some groups like Dr. Nelligan's group have, have, have really done a great job um, uh, at shortening this. Um, so you can mix some gadolinium with lidocaine, inject into web space, do a 30-second massage and image at 20 minutes, and you can image all along the way so you can have a dynamic image. And again, it's similar high-resolution 3D uh, T1-weighted uh, images, which are uh, fluid dark. Uh, here's an example we, we, we heard already about dermal backflow. Um, so, so they've published some nice work on looking at dermal backflow, and I think uh, that this really could be a great application for that. Um, dual agent relaxation, or DARK MRL, a, a great acronym for it. Um, so the idea is that you in, uh, infuse over time that iron agent compound I told you about, ferromoxetol, um, and it basically is a blood pool agent, so it stays in all the vessels. 
And then what, what they did was uh, uh, they adjust the parameters of imaging. So you take very bright veins, which you see here, and you just adjust the echo times and those veins disappear. So, uh, so the only thing you see here is lymphatic. So, so really does a great job of eliminating venous contamination, which can be a problem in, in injecting web spaces. Um, so uh, you may have even seen this slide before, but, but here's an example of an axillary vein uh, uh, being cut off due to extensive scarring. So again, when you're doing blood pool MR imaging, you know, we're already acquiring the same sequence, so we accomplish everything with those you know, sets of four sequences, which is nice because then you can just go from station to station. Um, donor site assessment. Uh, th this is an example of looking at inguinal lymph nodes. So, um, so as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, you know, I'll report on our cases which lymph nodes are lateral to the SIV and above the, the inguinal crease, and those might be the ones that are more favorable for harvesting uh, rather than uh, nodes in other locations. And um, uh, ERAs uh, uh, did a great job of, of looking at a bunch of data we had actually from our preoperative workups for deep flaps and, um, and highlighted that you know, most nodes are in this uh, zone one or, or, or landing region that, that you want to uh, be able to harvest. Uh, so how about postoperative imaging? We haven't talked a lot about that uh, thus far. Um, so the goals of postoperative imaging are really to evaluate the, the transfer flap. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit biased because that's, that's what I see uh, uh, based on the, the people I work with. Um, so we want to look at the number of nodes in that flap. Um, does the pedicle enhance? And do the nodes enhance with contrast? Again, intravenous contrast. Uh, what's the fat fluid characterization of the limb and or the flap? Um, vessel patency within and surrounding the, the flap, and flap viability. And I'll talk about that. You know, is it edematous? Does it have normal fat signal? Does it have abnormal fat signal? Um, and, then, and then assess the limb. Uh, uh, just as was mentioned earlier, we want a standardized way we assess the limb before and after. Um, uh, so, and then vascular assessment. Um, so here's some imaging just showing uh, pre-op, uh, showing you a bunch of vessels. Here is after transplant. You can see beautifully uh, uh, enhancing lymph nodes. Um, here's a patient that had a wrist flap, and you can actually see a bunch of nodes enhancing within that flap. And then on axial images, really you know, gorgeous architecture within those nodes. Um, so for flap viability, um, postoperative swelling is common. Um, but we really want to be, be able to look at the, uh, uh, the flap content. So here you can see this is a fluid, dark, fat, bright image. And here is a groin flap that unfortunately is not viable. So it's edematous, totally dark, um, and unfortunately uh, uh, this flap was infected. Um, here's a, um, running out of time, so I'm just going to run through these quickly. Here's an example of uh, limb volume reduction measurements that we use with uh, third-party software. Um, on axial images, you can see nicely the reduction in fluid content of this extremity and skin thickness. So you can have a global 3D assessment or, you know, an axial uh, uh, assessment. Um, and then just to finish up with reporting um, for, for any of the radiologists in the room, I know, uh, you know, Marty and Leo, and, and, and they're great. And they never read in a vacuum, and neither do I. So I would call the surgeon, you know, immediately and say, okay, let's talk about this if there's any, if there's any question. Um, there's a reporting template by Jeff Maki that, that I think is great, and, and we should probably use standardized reporting to incorporate it. Um, and also f uh, grading, you know, Joe talked about grading uh, techniques, so we should also incorporate standardized grading. Um, and uh, these are just some, some last examples of upper and lower extremities. So just to summarize, uh, MRA MRL is a robust radiation-free exam that can depict relevant anatomy, architecture, uh, exclude secondary causes, give you volumes, um, and look at veins and lymphatics. Um, and postoperatively, you can assess donor flaps, uh, you can assess viability, status of nodes, uh, uh, vessels, pedicles, um, and I think we really need to work on detecting subclinical disease um, and maybe ultrasound elastography. Um, we talked about ultrasound quickly. Maybe that's something that we could use. 
um, uh, to detect early disease, but, but, but we'll see. So anyway, uh, thank you so much.